Hello everyone, thanks for coming to the presentation. My name is Eric Belisle, I'm a solutions engineer here at Hasura, and I'm gonna be talking to you today about Supergraph and building a scalable API strategy for all of your data using GraphQL on top of your existing infrastructure. Uh, so quick, a little bit about myself. Uh, again, my name is Eric Belisle, I've been a full stack developer for a pretty long time now, but I've mainly been focused on building out data warehouses and API solutions for said warehouses. But uh, my personal experience with Hasura goes back about four years. I started using their community edition and ended up onboarding the enterprise solution at my previous employer. Uh, so I just joined the team here at Hasura about three months ago. I'm really excited uh, because this is, uh, you know, kind of what I was doing anyway. I was telling everybody they need to be using Hasura and how great GraphQL is. So here I am to do it all over again in front of in front of all of you. So a little bit of background about Hasura. Uh, we were founded in 2017. Uh, we were a small kind of uh, mobile app and web development company. Uh, we found a lot of the tools that we were using at the time were a bit lackluster. Um, ended up deciding to build our own solution uh, to automate a lot of the little nitpicky, you know, monotonous things that come with building out APIs and, you know, web applications and things like that. Um, so, a uh, little bit about the name. Uh, the name Hasura is actually a portmanteau of uh, the word Asura, which is Sanskrit for demon, uh, as well as the Haskell programming language. Um, so, Haskell was what we originally developed Hasura in, uh, version one. Uh, we've since moved on to Rust, but the name still stuck. Um, so, we keep it around. and. Uh, the whole uh, demon thing is a little bit different than probably the, uh, the Western concepts of demons that you might be familiar with. Uh, in this case, you know, it's sort of a, you know, these gods help you do the right thing while demons stop you from doing the wrong thing. Um, so that's just where the name came from. Uh, so internally, we like to say that data is the heartbeat of the modern world. Uh, should become so as no surprise to anyone. Uh, if you have any kind of service, you're going to need to feed it data from the back end somehow. Uh, so what we found in a traditional organization is that you end up with a bunch of teams that end up building out different microservices. And within each of those microservices, whichever team builds the microservice essentially gets to pick the flavor of the database that, that sits underneath it. So what you end up with is a whole bunch of disparate, you know, microservices all using their own different stacks. And you need to communicate that information out to your front end clients somehow. So historically, this has been done using REST endpoints. Um, you end up having to create one-to-one -one mappings for each particular client's use case. And basically it just takes a long time for new features to be implemented because the clients end up having to ask for these new mappings to be created. And, you know, that it has to go through a request process. Your development team has to pick it up, figure out when they can do it, start working on it, yada, yada, yada. So it, we found this kind of API infrastructure to be a little bit of a bottleneck in, in, in some cases. Uh, so what we've actually come up with is the idea of basically putting a super graph in front of all of your microservices and, and data services. Uh, what this does is it allows you to not only define your API through an infrastructure as code approach, uh, but it also gives you your end users the ability to compose data across the graph. Um, and it gives you, you know, federated ownership uh, to actually collaborate on this on the super graph. Uh, if you notice here at the bottom of the image, um, we've actually created these additional mappings uh, between these different microservices that just weren't possible before without the super graph layer in front of it. Uh, so from a traditional uh, a platform engineering perspective, this might look familiar. Uh, this is from the uh, Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Essentially, this is kind of a mapping of all of the things that your platform engineering team is capable of handling at, at this moment. Um, so, you know, we, we found a couple of things, you know, when it comes to API development specifically. Uh, and this quote from Stephen Wolfram actually resonates really well with us. Uh, he says, a lot of what the developers do is write slabs of boilerplate code and with a high enough uh, level of language, that slab of code turns into a single function that you can just use. 
sort of uh, that sort of boilerplate programming is going the way of assembly language. Uh, so the idea is that you know most of this boilerplate is just uh, input output on either a data source, a database, or some kind of code. You know, it could be an API endpoint, a webhook that responds with some sort of data. Um, and that's that's really what we've we've kind of found. So the question is, can we convert database IO to a function, right? Uh, can we, if we could do that, then we can just deploy everything through, uh, you know, a nice clean, you know, YAML file or a JSON file, you know, a la ter Terraform or something similar. Um, so we've noticed, you know, whether you're making a request for, you know, authors or articles inside of your database, they could live in different databases. Uh, but the, you know, the underlying middleware, the, the request is basically going to be the same input output. You're asking for an object, you're getting an object back. So, you know, we can kind of, you know, think about this as a, you know, just a normal service that you'd be deploying in uh, Kubernetes, for example. Uh, so here, you, this should look pretty familiar. This is just a YAML file defining a service to be deployed into Google Cloud. We can set a, a zone and a project on it. So... You know, why can't we do that with your database as well, right? Why can't we define that your database is Postgres, give it the tables, and get a CRUD API out on the other side? Uh, well, we should be able to do that, and we can do that using our SuperGraph solution. Uh, so now your query just becomes, you know, hey, you know, get get the author's ID and get name. Uh, pretty straightforward example. Um but we can actually take this logic a little bit further now. And since we're able to define, you know, what, what the database looks like inside of the, the IAC approach, we can now start doing fancy things like defining relationships, whether that be between, you know, two tables within the same database or two tables within completely separate databases. Uh, so on the left side here, you see a basic example of how, to, how we might define a re relationship using IAC. Uh, and on the, the right side here, we've got uh, a permissions example where we're defining a role of admin and specifying the fields that they have access to. Um, so what we found is actually that uh, GraphQL is uh, a great, you know, natural intermediate representation for any and all kind of data sources that we, we find within most organizations. And uh, the great advantage of GraphQL is that it can serve any CRUD requests on any permutation of types uh, in the source that our middleware works with, right? So if we can plug into your database, then we can do CRUD operations on it, essentially. Uh, the same principle can help to generate, you know, gRPC, tRPC, uh, you know, pretty much any kind of RPC that you're looking for. Uh, you just need a good type system to represent everything, and that's what GraphQL gives us here. Uh, so now, once we've got our SuperGraph layer imposed or implemented, we can um, actually change that authors and articles call down to a single HTTP request, have our middleware go reach out to, you know, one or several data sources to pull that information out and return it to your client all in one single request. Uh, so again, you know, now we've got a self-serve API layer that supports data aggregation and comp and composition. Essentially, your users can come in, request exactly what they want, and not have to wait for a particular development team to build out an endpoint that you know queries the database in the exact way that they the, that particular client needs it. Um, so we're finding that GraphQL is you know becoming kind of the the de facto language for you know the, your data access layer nowadays. Um, on top of all that, with this kind of uh, infrastructure as code approach, um, we've also found our, we've uh, set up our uh, stateless system. So essentially, we can deploy as many instances of our uh, of our API as as needed in as many regions and as many zones as we want. Uh, because essentially, what's happening uh, is when a request comes in, we're just converting your GraphQL query into the native language or languages of your data sources. So, um, you know, really this gives you the flexibility to, uh, you know, scale uh, as much as you want while still maintaining that, you know, level of uh, access control uh, over your entire uh, data architecture. 
Uh, so on top of, you know, the previous example, we can see how, you know, we might extend that original Postgres example to be deployed in multi-region. Uh, so now we can have our stateless service access, you know, uh, you know, region specific databases, um, handle multi-tenancy, things like that. We can handle all that through this kind of IAC approach. Um, so what we've done here is we've really taken all of the uh, CRUD data API creation, you know, crunched it down into this data management box inside of this original platform engineering diagram, really empowering the platform engineering teams to be able to build out and manage the API infrastructure uh, within an organization. Um, so if you do have any questions uh, or you'd like to know more about the Supergraph, uh, my name is Eric Belial. You can find me on LinkedIn and I'm sure my Contact information will be somewhere on the PlatformCon uh, website. Uh, so please do feel free to reach out uh, if you have any questions at all. Uh, but thanks again for coming to my talk and uh, hopefully we'll see you soon.